Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you Dr. Jamel Wright, the 27th president of Eureka College, Ronald Reagan's alma mater. Dr. Wright is the first woman in African American to lead the 165-year-old institution. During a 2019 interview with the Reagan Foundation about her time as president of Eureka College, Dr. Wright said, I walk around with my chest poked out. It is definitely a prideful thing to say that I am able to serve as the first woman in African American president of our college. The same college that graduated the 40th president of the United States of America, the same president that selected Sandra Day O'Connor to be the first woman to sit on the Supreme Court. She concluded in that interview, It's always wonderful to be invited to speak about some of my thoughts about President Reagan, because I've grown to have even more fondness for him than I did before becoming president of Eureka College. During today's conversation, Dr. Wright will discuss President Reagan's formative years at Eureka, President Reagan's early advocacy for racial equality, and the challenges posed by COVID-19 to higher education. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program with Dr. Jamel Wright and the Ronald Reagan Institute Director of Learning and Leadership, Janet Tran. Hello and welcome. I'm your guest host, Janet Tran, the Director of the Center for Civics, Education and Opportunity at the Ronald Reagan Institute. And I am so privileged and thrilled to have one of my favorite people here today, Dr. Jamel Wright, the 27th President of Eureka College, President Reagan's own alma mater. How are you doing today, Jamel? I'm fantastic, and I have to say you stole my thunder because you are one of my favorite people too. So I am thrilled to be here. It is an honor and a privilege to join you uh, today, and, and I appreciate the invitation so much. Well, Dr. Wright, you are a college president amidst a global pandemic, and I imagine um, there's not too much downtime. Let's start by just walking us through the day of a college president right now. Oh my goodness, no downtime. Every attempt at vacation has been an epic fail uh, all summer long. So there, there's no such thing as vacation. And I keep telling my presidential colleagues that I clearly missed the day we covered what to do during a pandemic and my orientation. So uh, again, as everyone keeps saying, there's no playbook. So my day starts very early in the morning uh, with briefings and updates uh, as it pertains to COVID testing and those kinds of things. We're off and running. Our classes started three days ago, and we are have students back in person. Students are living on campus. So it's quite a bit to manage, as you can imagine. Uh, we have a very thorough back-to-campus plan that was sent out to our entire campus community. Uh, we have these nice, handy-dandy Eureka College masks. I'm expecting uh, that, mine now. <laughs> that's right, it's, part, it's, it's a new part of my uniform. So I'm trying to embrace, embrace that, that, that part of the uniform. Uh, but but it is there. There's a lot of long days, and there's still a lot of really move, a lot of moving parts, um, as everyone I know knows and appreciates, and a lot of moving parts and a lot of reliance on our students who we think just the the, the most of to really make good and smart decisions. Um, as I know, a lot of people have seen in the news, a lot of colleges and universities um, who are larger that a lot larger than Eureka College have not been able to really manage the off campus activities of students. And so we're a lot smaller. We're able to leverage our size through this pandemic. So long days for a college president, not a lot of vacation, uh, but, uh, but and, and maybe, uh, you know, a, a glass of wine. My, my wine intake has increased uh, at least by a glass per week. Uh, just one glass, though. And, and I'm still not drinking for noon. So I don't I'll want any... 2020. That's that's perfectly <laughs> fine. So it hasn't gotten that bad yet, but but long days, a lot a lot of work. But uh, when you have a really great team like we do at Eureka College and you have an opportunity to work with such great students and families, 
it that actually gives me great peace um, and energy. Well, there's no easy answers during these times. And I think we'll get a little more granular later, but let, let's take a little walk back in time right now and sure. yeah. talk about the history of Eureka College and how it was founded. Because I think that uh, plays a really key role in the character of, of the institution that you serve and the institution that served Ronald Reagan, our 40th president, so well. Absolutely. So some 73 years prior to Reagan uh, coming to Eureka College, the college was chartered in 1855. Uh, by a group of abolitionists who were members of the Christian church, the Disciples of Christ, who were from Kentucky uh, and said to be friends of Abraham Lincoln. So these abolitionist founders of ours came here and uh, chartered a college that was the first in the state of Illinois and third in the nation to admit women and men on an equal basis as we sit here celebrating 100 years of women getting the right to vote. Uh, how appropriate of a reflection to think about this little college in central Illinois amidst the corn and soy fields that uh, had founders who had the wherewithal and the courage to uh, say, we're going we're gonna to admit women uh, here at our college just uh, to the same extent that we admit men for a college education. Uh, so what a, what a wonderful, rich history we have. Uh, 1928 is when we welcomed Dutch Reagan uh, to our campus as a student. And so um, his time here, again, the college had, had been established uh, 73 years prior to that. We were already admitting women. Uh, one of his closest friends was uh, Willie Sue Smith Stewart, uh, an African-American woman who we believe was the first uh, to graduate along with Dutch Reagan uh, in 1932. She was from Tyler, Texas, uh, where she could not pursue a college education at that time, right? She had to come all the way from Texas uh, in order to do that. So yes, definitely a rich history. And you mentioned, of course, Dutch Reagan, he, we are the smallest college to ever graduate a future president of the United States by leaps and bounds. We're the smallest. Well, there's a lot of stories there. Um, I understand that uh, Willie Sue Smith, she used to uh, pass notes back and forth uh, between uh, then uh, Dutch Reagan and uh, and his, his then girlfriend, and um, you know, uh, apparently she was uh, moved away because her father said uh, President Reagan's good looks would uh, get get her into a lot of trouble. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, um, you know, Reagan was a um, he he was a looker. He was quite the looker. I'm sure people have seen a lot of pictures of the young Reagan, the Eureka College Reagan um, that we yeah, have all over around. our campus. That's right. That's that's the one. That's one of my favorite pictures quite honestly. And yes, her, her dad did say that. And he was on the swim team. Uh, and, you know, the rumor has it or history has it. I don't know that, um, you know, there were a lot of young ladies who almost drowned uh, while he was a lifeguard um, <laughs> so that he could, you know, jump in and save them. Um, and he also, he worked in Lida's Wood, one of our residence halls on campus, and it was an all-female dorm. And he said for quite a long time that that was washing dishes in that dormitory was one of the, his favorite jobs. Um, I don't know if anyone asked him while he was president or after if that still remained one of his favorite jobs. Um, I but, don't know but, if had a chance. You know, it, it was definitely in the top three. It's, it probably remained in the top three. For him. You know, one of um, a really powerful moment uh, when I had the privilege to visit Eureka was standing in that stage where he gave his first yes. major speech. I'd love for you to just share a little bit about uh, the words that we felt uh, reached the audience for the first time and that excitement. Oh, my goodness. So this is where this is all the things, the makings of leadership. Right. Reagan, here he is, a freshman, uh, still a freshman student in 1928. And and there are all these concerns about budget cuts and, and the then president who I guess was banning certain activities like dances on campus and students were riled up and, and um, talking about a strike and they picked him uh, and asked him to deliver a speech. As you said, the, the stage in the chapel, uh, McAllister Hall is still there today on our campus. And he stood on that stage and delivered his first speech and he said later in his biography of how exciting that was for him. And he actually talked about how it was at that moment that he realized how influential his voice could be. Uh, so when we talk about finding your vision and voice, you know, that's a, a really key example 
uh, for Dutch Reagan all the way back in 1928, but, but he was identified even then as a leader, uh, getting up on that stage, the courage that it had to take for him to do that. The students ultimately did strike, the president ultimately resigned. Um, so, so I think he's right. That was, he, he's, his voice had to have been influential then. You've mentioned the word courage a couple of times, and I think there's courage, and I think there's room for courage, too, and the context of Eureka certainly uh, provides, provides that room for courage. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories about President Reagan's almost naivety when, um, you know, he was on the football team, and one of his lifelong, uh, you know, he called one of the closest friends of his life, uh, Bergy, but, uh, you know, I think uh, Dr. Burghardt, if we're going to be a little more official, um, you know, and the experiences they had and his his kind of eye-opening experience to see uh, what racial injustice looked like, because that's just not the way he was raised. Right. Well, and you know, he he was definitely a, a man of his times and all of that, but he was raised uh, in a home where, you know, there's a story of his dad who refused to patronize a gas station because, um, and, and Dutch was with him the day that they went to this gas station and and the owner of the gas station refused a, a black man and his son to, to serve them. And um, his dad said, let's go. Um, he left and did not patronize that gas station. So he grew up seeing those kinds of things, even if there was not a lot of conversation around them, that's what he grew up and what was etched in his mind. And so when he came to this place founded by abolitionists, uh, when he came to this place where women had been admitted and he was alongside the likes of a Willie Sue Smith Stewart, uh, an African-American woman in, in 1928, um, then again, that was yet another influential time for him. And that's where he began to exercise uh, and showcase some of the things that he grew up learning. Uh, and that included the, the moment when his football team traveled to another small um, town in Illinois to play a game. They had to have an overnight stay. Uh, someone very influential in Reagan's life was Coach Ralph McKenzie, um, who's beloved on our campus still to this day in terms of his memory. And um, they they traveled. There were two members, two African Americans on the team, including, as you said, Bergie, who uh, was a good friend of Reagan's. And uh, the hotel owner they wouldn't allow them to stay there because of the two black players. So Reagan and his quick thinking. Um, again, even though he may not have been putting the language around what was happening, he knew that there was something not right about that and suggested that they go just a short distance to his parents' home, where he and those Black players ultimately spent the night. And so that was uh, something that, again, you know, whether the conversations at that point were being had, it, it's just like today, where a lot of our students at Eureka College may not come with the tools and the language to really share and express themselves as it pertains to some of these issues around racial injustice and, and other things. But, but we provide for them the tools to be able to do that and to be able to know when you see something that's not right, you have to be empowered to actually act um, to try to correct it. And that's what Reagan did in that, in that moment uh, when that happened with Fergie and the other uh, Black football teammate. Yeah, context is so important. We, you know, we certainly can't hold a uh what happened in the 1920s uh, to today's standards. I think what really struck me though was, um, you know, when they interviewed uh, Dr. Bernhard Berge many years later, he said, oh, we absolutely knew that, that right. the hotel wasn't full, but we just played along as well. And there was just so much um, sort of good faith in sort of those interactions and um, almost, uh, you know, very touching that he would, you know, kind of play along because he he didn't want to just shatter this, this uh, this optimism that was is obviously a hallmark of President Reagan's. I think what you're talking about a lot is um, about the concept of a village, and you know it really did take a village to uh, to raise our 40th president. And something I don't know we do a good job at the foundation or as a whole is telling the story of how difficult it was for President Reagan to graduate from Eureka College. He you know, he didn't have the money. He didn't, he wasn't born into means. And, uh, you know, there were many times when he thought he wasn't going to come back and finish, but, you know, it was Coach McKinsey, as you said, it was the community, it was these scholarships. I'd love to know more about, um, you know, his modest background and how you think that that approach impacted um, him and his leadership throughout his career and, you know, how you continue that sort of, um, that sort of spirit of, of, it takes a village at Eureka today. Absolutely. Well, that's actually a great question and observation there, uh, Janet. And I will tell you that 
Uh, if you put side by side the profile of President Reagan and our students today, it is eerily similar. Uh, the type of student who, that Eureka College has now for over 165 years helped to become leaders and grow and develop is the same, right? And it doesn't mean that the, the educational experience is exactly the same, right? It's, it's We've remained relevant. We've continued to put our education and curriculum in a 21st century packaging. But it does mean that the threads that are common over our 165 years uh, is still that we service first-generation students. Reagan is the only president born, raised, and educated all the way through college in the state of Illinois. Um, how proud should we be of that? Very proud, because as you said, he came from modest means. A lot of our students today, 48% of our students qualify for federal aid, even today. Uh, he was a first generation student, uh, the first in his family to earn a degree. And today, 41% of our students continue to be first generation who we serve. Okay. He, so, I mean, you, and you're right, the modest means, meeting that, that affirmation from Coach McKenzie that not only could he do it, not only could he succeed, but that Coach McKenzie was willing to be one of those many people who was providing him with even the financial resources and support. Uh, again, the same types of things that we do today with freezing tuition for students and those kinds of things and providing that unique experience. Side by side again, Reagan, you know, he was a double major. He participated in multiple sports, not just football. He, you know, um, was in student government, the president of student government uh, at some point in time. He performed in plays, you know, multiple plays, about 14 of them. And today, that is the same type of profile of our student, where we provide that well-rounded experience. We provide them with the transferable and essential skills and that confidence that we give them that they really can do anything. And Reagan is the ultimate proof of that. When you talk about outcomes, there's no better outcome than saying you produce someone who went on to become president of the United States, who came from those humble beginnings and then came to a small little Eureka College uh, in central Illinois with an undergraduate degree that prepared him so well to build um, that he ultimately became a leader uh, of, the, of the entire country and world, dare I say. So, so we continue to do that 165 years later where students are majoring, right? We just celebrated our graduates a few days ago for our 2020 graduates. Many of them either double major or major and two minors. Um, again, the profiles are eerily similar uh, when you look at Reagan and our students today. What an incredible legacy, uh, just, just thinking about the history of, of being there, um, you know, brings back a lot of memories for me. Uh, we, we could talk about uh, President Reagan's stories all day, but I definitely want to save some time uh, to touch upon um, your leadership journey, which is, is distinctly unique as well. Um, you are a college president and uh, an African-American woman college president, and I believe that percentile is, it lingers in the low, you know, single digits, maybe five, eight percent, maybe nine percent if we're going to be wild. And I would love to understand, um, you know, who are the distinct role models, the people you looked up to, who have um, have provided that sort of support to you as you've uh, trailed uh, trailblaze in your own right? Yeah, well, you know, uh, thank you for that question. And so I, like Reagan, I'm a first generation uh, college student as well. Uh, first in my family to earn a college degree. And yet I grew up, My role, one of my biggest role models is my mother. I grew up with parents who were small business owners. Um, they created uh, a cleaning service, a uh, company janitorial service, and watching my mother, um, you know, be this businesswoman and, and having all these conversations with mostly men, uh, you know, was absolutely amazing. Negotiating contracts. I mean, she did all of the business part and some of the work, too. Um, so I grew up in this household where my parents were entrepreneurs. And where the, the, the word was that failure is part of growth, but quitting is never an option. Uh, and so that was, that stuck with me and being able to see my mother, a woman, her, you know, a woman in a leadership role and, and owning a company uh, and doing all of the things that she did and what they were able to accomplish. So she was one of my first role models. And then I went on to Missouri Western State University in St. Joseph, Missouri and the University of Kansas. So I learned how to be 
people centered from my mother. And then at those institutions, I learned how to be student focused uh, because it was there that all of those people in the same way that we did, that Eureka College did for Dutch, they affirmed me um, and they gave me the confidence that, that I could do anything. Um, so I had um, a really significant role model in, in, in a lot of female professors um, and, and my male professors were very supportive as well. But being able to see someone who looks like you should never, ever be underestimated the importance of that. And being able to see people in all of these different roles uh, provides for you kind of a wealth of opportunity that you really think you can pursue it and that you can do it. Um, having Black professors in my graduate program, Dr. Shannon Campbell was instrumental um, to my success. And, and then my graduate advisor, he and I were probably an unlikely pair, Don Parson, who spoke at my inauguration. Uh, but I've really had some instrumental mentors, you're right, uh, and circle of advisors in my life and people who God put in my path, um, who I know were placed there for the very purpose of reminding me of the importance of service, uh, the importance of mentoring others, the importance of leadership, um, and the importance of understanding that leadership is going to come with failures and it's okay as long as you grow from those failures. So you're right, being, being the first female, being the first African-American president of this esteemed college is, is an, the honor of my life. Um, but it's also the result of all of those people who I named and those who I didn't, who affirmed me and put me on the right path and helped me when I faltered. And that's, what, that's why being at a Eureka College is so critically important to me uh, as, as we're doing the same thing for students here. Just because you've went there already, I just want to make sure, um, you know, that I don't forget to ask you, what, what's some advice that you would have for this next generation of, of trailblazers and people who are going to be first? You know, we, we hosted an event last fall uh, celebrating the, uh, the nomination and appointment of the first female justice, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who did give a keynote at Eureka College. And what was so, um, you know, what struck me so much is being first you don't just have to be twice as good. You have to blaze the trail, but you have to build those bridges for those who will follow. And Absolutely. even tougher, you have to build bridges to people who don't want you there. You really Absolutely. have to build bridges to, to your rivals. So, you know, we're not meeting the American promise yet. We, we get close to every day and, um, you know, it's a two steps forward, one step back. And I'd just love to hear some advice from your personal experiences for those who, who still unfortunately need to blaze trails of, of their own. Absolutely. Well, you know, you're absolutely right. And you, you kind of said what I would, I would build upon, which is, it's not just about, you know, it, building bridges and, and really focusing on people with whatever that experience may be, who have the same experiences as you or all of that. It's actually really about reaching out, right? Um, it's about reaching out and understanding that re respecting difference and recognizing difference is not the antithesis of unity. So we can respect difference and celebrate difference and still present a united front around common, a common purpose. Uh, and that it is indeed the beauty of our country um, to, that you see this patchwork quilt of differences and yet we continue to be able to rise above uh, and accomplish the things we're able to. So I always encourage people to you know make sure you ask for help when you need it. That's another thing that I think um, sometimes we feel like, you know, when you're on a trail to be first or, you know, when you're going to be a leader that, oh, you know, leaders are supposed to have all the answers or, you know, I'm not supposed to ask for help, but you have to ask for help. Um, and, and an inability to ask for help actually will hinder your progress and ability um, to, to blaze any trail that you're trying to, to pursue. Um, but ask for help. Surround yourself with people who are unlike you. Uh, and so, you know, I often tell people that I, I, I dislike the language when people talk about fit. Oh, this person is not a fit. Um, and so usually you'll hear me say, well, I think we need more misfits. You know, <laughs> we need more misfits. And, and I like that, the misfit um, kind of idea in my life because I need people who provide me a perspective of which I don't have. Um, and, and also I think understanding that Again, the biggest room of which all of us are a part is the room for improvement. So you're going to have failures. Um, we're all in the room for improvement. 
none of us is ever going to have all the answers. Um, the best thing that you can do as you become a leader, as you as you strive to build on your leadership um, skills, is to understand that you're not expected necessarily to have all the answers, but you are expected to be able to surround yourself with people who can help get you there, right? Who may be able to provide all those answers for you. And so, um, interestingly, those are there's some similarities to some great leaders um, over our lifetime who. I would say, you know, I, I align myself with, with, with those things and anyone who's going to be called a great leader and who's going to bear the burden, because it is, I'll, I'll admit that it is a burden to be a first. Um, it's not easy to be a first, um, but you do have to keep your powder dry and you do have to have thick skin. Um, having thick skin is very important and understanding that some comments and some attitudes come out of what I would say is genuine ignorance, ignorance in its truest sense. Um, and it's, some of it is naivete, like we talked about with Dutch, right. And the, and the, the Bergie story, um, some of it is naivete and it's worth getting to know someone, uh, and their character and who they are, um, before you just outright make certain judgments, but you got to have a thick skin and, uh, Mike Murtaugh, um, who, you know, very well, he and I talk all the time about the importance of a positive mental attitude. And I will tell you that a positive mental attitude can help you to overcome so many things. And having a positive mental attitude in spite of pandemics, in spite of racial injustice, in spite of all of those things, maintaining that positive mental attitude um, is something that is critically important to our growth and development as individuals. And is critically important to the growth and development of leaders um, and the ability to lead any group of people. Uh, so you're never going to do it in an echo chamber. You're never going to do it if it's just you doing it. Indeed, every movement in the history of this country, including the one for the right women's right to vote uh, from 1920, included some of everyone, including people who didn't think women should vote. Um, you had to fi figure out how to rally people around common purpose. Uh, and so that's what I think is, is needed if you're, if you're going to blaze that trail um, that you're right, we're still finding first and people are still finding themselves being in situations to be the first. Um, but you have to be able to possess all of those characteristics. And you got to remember self-care. Um, you got to remember when you need to take a step back, take a deep breath um, and, and just say, hey, I need a minute. Um, and then that's really tough to do. Um, that's maybe even tougher to do than ask for help, quite frankly, is because you, you often think that people see you and they think, um, you know, you, you should be able to go 24 seven, 365. Um, but as you know, no, if one you can. do that, <laughs> yeah, that's right. No one can do that. Right. We're all, we're just human beings, right? We're, we're human beings and we're not perfect. Uh, and so realizing and recognizing all of those things that you're not perfect, you're going to fail. Uh, you gotta be strong enough to be able to pick yourself back up and rely on others to help you, to help uplift you, have that thick skin, have a positive mental attitude. Um, no matter what, always be open to learning new things and being teachable and coachable. I tell people all the time that one of the things about me is I'm, I'm teachable, I'm coachable. Uh, so I'm coming to the table, yes, as a leader, a confident one, as a matter of fact, but I know that there's still so much I can learn from all the people around me. And I want to surround myself with people who are willing to teach me as much as I am to teach them. I always find it amazing when people are just so rigid and structured because I always say I reserve the right to change my mind mid sentence. It's it's me learning, and I'm I'm happy that I've changed my mind. So I'm so glad that you shared that uh, that that this ultimate um, because we have so much to learn as as a people mm -hmm. and as a country. And you know something that's been on my mind is obviously this this reckoning that we're facing, um, not just amidst the global pandemic, but sort of this um, movement that I'm cautiously optimistic about. Uh, with this, uh, this reckoning with you know, our quest for racial justice and meeting the American promise. I think back a lot to that, uh, that day, I was privileged to drive uh, from Chicago to Eureka College and uh, visit your campus and you know, celebrate with your students. And you know, I am a prof you know, professed city uh, woman and I, I've never really been immersed into uh, that sort of community before. And, you know, there was just so much love abound from the students. They loved you. You know, the parents, they loved you. And it was the first time in my life where I realized I, why people might perceive themselves as not seeing color. I'd always assumed if anyone said that they were a bad faith actor 
and you know just weren't weren't uh, part of the solution. But I'm curious as you you see this community that uh, embraces you so much and you know really believes in your leadership to you know ensure that their students and their loved ones have the best future possible. You know how do you uh, how do you communicate? How do you reckon with uh, these people who could be our allies, but maybe just don't see racism as a problem in this country? Yeah. So you know that um, that is um, an interesting challenge and the the question of the day, right? It's that um, a lot of people don't see it. Some people may not want to see it, and so I think there are a lot of ways to to open the door for conversations. You're never going to you know take a hammer and beat anyone over the head again. Indeed, everybody, every leader, every good leader, effective leader understands that. They're, they're all kind of tools in your tool belt and the hammer is the last one you ever want to use. Uh, and so I think there's so many other productive ways to engage people in conversations around how we're socialized and the history of the country. Ultimately, Janet, here's what I will tell you. It's that I'm, I'm never necessarily always interested in someone saying, okay, okay, you're right. This is your experience now tells me that this is absolutely happening and has happened. Um, What I am interested in, though, is the mutual respect that has to happen for someone to say, I respect your experiences. Um, I don't disbelieve your experiences, even though that's not my experience. Um, And I am willing to partner with you to figure out how we can indeed move the country forward because moving the country forward uh, means that everyone is more prosperous, right? It's the shining city on the hill that, that Reagan talked about, um, you know, in, in many of his speeches that he referenced. It's that American welcome, yes. Please, right, you please. know, it is where everyone, right? And, and being at Eureka College, I'll tell you, one of the things I've learned about the Disciples of Christ is, um, which is, you know, our founders, they were, they were disciples, is that when they say everyone is welcome, they mean everyone everyone. So it doesn't matter your race or your sexual orientation or identity or your gender. None of those things matter. And um, there's something about being able to engage people in a, a thoughtful, civil conversation, agree without, you know, uh, disagree without being disagreeable um, and actually respecting other people's experiences. Again, even though they may not necessarily be your own, that I think opens the door for some of the substantive change that's going to have to take place. Um, you know, we, we may not be able to get everyone to the same place where we are in one conversation, two, 10 or 15 uh, conversations, but that we get to a place where everyone understands that there has to be, the, the reckoning is making sure that everyone understands that we're all a part of this country. We are all Americans, right? And that all of our ancestors helped to build this country. Um, so as an African-American, then, you know, I'm not somehow outside of the, the country or somehow a second class citizen in terms of my American citizenship. Um, my ancestors, too, helped to build this country. And indeed, because of the inextricable linkages of our legacies, my ancestors are yours and everyone else's also. Um, so I think that's the reckoning is once we realize that. Um, and, and there are always going to be people who possess certain types of attitudes and beliefs that may be counter to that. But the groundswell of support, like you said, from some of the movements, um, the efforts that we've seen more recently gives me to that optimism that we're in a different place than we may have been before. And there's some doors opening for conversations where before they may have been closed shut. Now there's there's a little bit of, of room for us to, to enter into some really tough conversations. Uh, and we do that here at Eureka College. So you're right. Um, it's that, and I'll tell you the, the one thing to round out this answer. The reason that I will tell you um, that I have the support that I do and uh, from students, from parents, and that we're able to have some of those conversations is because of what I told you I learned from my mother, which is how to be people-centered. People matter. And if you're able to let people know and they understand that they matter, and that their experiences matter, and that you're willing to listen to their experiences, um, then that's important, and that's gonna that's gonna get us all far. 
Well, I couldn't agree more. Those relationships um, that you talk about are really central as we think about repairing the American fabric and, and the civic discourse in, in our country. So, you know, we talked a bit about, you know, uh, individuals and organizations, you know, saying the right words or doing things that are performative, but without the relationships, you know, we're not going to make the progress that we need. Right. So very much yeah. appreciate that they are still small liberal arts colleges like Eureka that uh, provide opportunities for relationship building. And mm -hmm. I want to move into the part where uh, you get to have fun and brag a little bit about Eureka <laughs> College because my favorite thing to do. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, let, let's, let's get into the nitty gritty though. Like what uh, it's, what are you and your team doing to, you know, how did you open up the school? How did you decide um, what to do to keep our students safe? to keep them learning, to ensure that the legacy of Eureka College continues in spite of every challenge of 2020. Yeah. So, you know, this, um, the, the, the challenge of, of 2020, and I have to tell you a quick funny story. So everybody keeps saying, you know, normally you don't want time to move fast. We, we're all trying to hold on and you want more, but I can't wait to get out. I keep telling people 2020. Oh my goodness. And so I was, I went into my office the other day and, you know, when your clock stops, normally I'm used to my clock stopping on an actual time. So it'll be perpetually 1.30, you know, because I need a new battery. Well, this particular day I went into my office and the time is stuck on 7.74. So I'm convinced, it's not even a real time. So I'm convinced that that's a 2020 thing. I just want you to know. It's, it is 7.74. It's what it says. So anytime anything odd happens. I didn't know that was just possible. Saying, and I, was just, I just say it's 7.74. It's 7.74 again today. Uh, but Seriously, though, you know, the the advantage of uh, a small liberal arts college to begin with is um, the ability for us to provide a customizable, tailor-made experience um, for students that provides them with all of the transferable and essential skills that they need to, to really challenge or to really take on the challenges of some of the very things we've been talking about, the pan a pandemic, um, you know, social unrest, uh, racial injustice and those kinds of things. Um, the reality is that higher education, as you know, uh, given all of the wonderful RISE conferences that um, the foundation has hosted over the last few years, um, is that higher education, it was already under a major transformation, uh, already undergoing a huge paradigmatic shift in terms of our approach to doing things, how we educate students, uh, understanding the today's student and the need for us to change, uh, what I call positive disruptive change. Uh, so what we've done here at Eureka College, and so thank goodness our timing couldn't have been better, but a couple years ago, we actually completely reimagined our general education curriculum. It's now called the 10 Essentials. Uh, we have a, a, an understanding about today's essential skills that students need in order to be able to reinvent themselves. Reagan was ahead of his time because he, he trans, transitioned five to five different careers, right? Which in many ways was unheard of then, but today it's the norm. It's the norm that our students are gonna reinvent themselves and they're gonna be required to reinvent themselves even if they don't really want to because of the technology and you know all of these other things around us are so rapidly changing. And so what we've done at Eureka College is to focus in on those essential skills and, and understanding that listen, you can, you can know everything that there is to know in your content area, but if you graduate without an ability to communicate well, without the ability to effectively solve problems, to think critically, to work on a team, and to indeed lead a team, then all of that expertise in that content area is not going to be as valuable, right? You have to have those foundational, transferable, essential skills that will lead you into careers that are yet unknown to all of us. So we were already undergoing, undergoing that transformation. Our 10 Essentials curriculum um, helped us along the way. When this pandemic hit, uh, um, we, we, there, there's not much that, that we changed. Of course, going remote was a challenge in the spring because we had to do it so rapidly. And Eureka College, and, and you've been here, and, and I will tell you that if you, if you really want to know the story of Reagan, and I know you will attest to this, you can't truly know the full story and understand the story of Reagan without visiting Eureka College. So I, I extend an open-ended invitation to anyone listening to the podcast to visit the campus of Eureka College. You will have such a more, a clearer and better understanding and maybe even appreciation 
for Reagan and his story and the, the Reagan story that, that Eureka College holds near and dear and is one of our points of pride. So now back back to the other question. So, no, so this, is, this is the bragging portion of the yeah, podcast. Yeah, because part of it, though, part of what Reagan got here, part right, of what our students today get, very, very much the, a Eureka moment. <laughs> it is Eureka. <laughs> is the is the but is the personal right? The personal mm-hmm. experience, the personal relationships, which are a lot more difficult to maintain remotely. Um, so the when the pandemic hit, we're thinking, oh my goodness, you know, we have to go a hundred percent. Um, with remote learning for the remainder of the semester, less than ideal. Thank goodness it was in the middle of a semester and in the spring, because a lot of relationships, especially for our freshmen who were new to campus, had been formed, right? And so we were really building on that. Um, But we really spent, I mean, as you can imagine, countless hours just with a plan. We talk about a uniquely Eureka experience, the uniquely Eureka experience that Reagan received, the uniquely Eureka experience that we create for our students today. So how do you create and ensure a uniquely Eureka experience in the midst of a pandemic? Um, you know, how do you bring students back and still make sure that there's something about that educational experience that we're still providing those opportunities for them with all the safety precautions that we can even think of to put in place um, to make them comfortable enough to enjoy the actual experience itself. So that's really what we focused on doing, uh, Janet, is we focused on still making sure we have a uniquely Eureka experience, still making sure that all of the transferable skills that students are going to need when they leave this place to be good citizens, to be leaders, um, to to indeed be transformational in, in all of their pursuits, that we're still able to provide some semblance of that. Uh, in spite of this pandemic. And so we started the year, our classes started three days ago in person. Students are living on campus. We've been able to provide them with single rooms. Um, we've, provi- we've gotten some help, of course, from the Department of Education with some of the CARES Act funds. Um, so really thankful to Congress for acting as quickly as they did initially to push through some of that funding um, because we, we've not been without the need. Um, And what I'll say now that is a big focus of our attention, as it is for higher ed more generally, is now affordability becomes even more important, right? A spotlight is now on questions about affordability and access in ways now with the pandemic and people losing jobs and, you know, being furloughed and all of those things now more than ever. Uh, And so the, the, the pandemic has caused the acceleration of some of the paradigmatic shifts that were already occurring in higher ed, Eureka College is stepping up to that challenge as we did when we completely reimagined our curriculum to become the 10 essentials um, to make sure that we had an eye in preparing our students for what's ahead and what's unknown. And so we're just continuing to try to do that. And we're doing that with the support of an amazing team of faculty, staff, and and senior leaders. Um, You know, there's nothing like a good old pandemic to show you where your team is weak or where your team is exceedingly strong. And we've proven the latter time and time and time again uh, in in our situation. And so, uh, and then there's nothing like a good old pandemic to remind you of the, to appreciate the donors who, and and alumni who continue to support this wonderful college, um, who continue to appreciate the Reagan story um, and his, you know, the, the, the finding his vision and voice and going on to become president of the United States after leaving Little Eureka. And undoubtedly, I can tell you, we'll probably graduate somebody else who will go on and become president, uh, you know, sometime down the road uh, because, of, because of our ability to pivot and quickly change um, and, and really stay true to the mission and, and who we are and the things we've been providing for over 165 years, and yet make sure that we're able to reflect the needs of society and prepare our students accordingly. So all of that was a way to weave in all of the things that you asked. It was a truly, you're right, opportunity for me to brag about this amazing college that is Eureka. Uh, And and again, to offer everybody, extend the the opportunity for people to to visit. Visit the college. Talk to our students. Um, I visited in April, Janet, an an April, beautiful April day before I started here. Um, Now I'm in my seventh year. And um, I will never forget it ever because I had been looking forever in search of a college home um, where it was that place where you could establish those types of relationships and be really people centered, right? You could be the president, 
and still have substantive relationships with students and their families uh, and really have that listening ear um, to understand the needs of the families and the students and not just have to exist in, in a building on a larger campus. So I've been a lot of wonderful campuses, wonderful educational experiences um, that I've helped to deliver as a professor. Um, but Eureka College is that place. And if you've never visited, you absolutely must put it on your, your to-do list. Even, even It's even a bucket list item. I would go as far as to say it's a bucket list. I think it's, it's definitely part of the uh, President Reagan tour for sure. And absolutely, absolutely. What, what absolutely. I'm thinking about is this, you know, this rapidly evolving world, and I've used the word rapidly evolving more this year than I'd ever thought I would in my lifetime. And I think mm -hmm. what's so fascinating is the, you know, you mentioned all of these deep inequities and these challenges like affordability. They all existed before COVID-19. These aren't new issues. Um, COVID-19 simply sort of removed, uh, you know, the, the wallpaper or exposed right, the that's right. the lines. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's, um, there's a lot of challenges to support your students who are mostly first generation, but you're a bit of a futurist and I would love, um, you know, to, to just tap into your brain a little bit and, you know, ask you, what do you think, you know, the future of higher education can look like in a post COVID-19 world? You know, we can't use the same models, you know, and we address this at the Reagan Institute Summit on Education. We can't just keep moving along, you know, hiking up tuition, you know, not ensuring that our students are taken care of after college. So what does, um, what does the higher education, the post-secondary landscape look like five, 10 years post COVID? Yeah. You know, I think one of the, the biggest uh, things that's going to be drastically different that's already starting to happen is that we're going to see finally uh, collaborative partnerships with in like institutions um, that in the past would have made you gasp. It's like, oh my goodness, aren't you all competitors? You know, um, but we're going to start to see some more substantive partnerships that exist that haven't before. Uh, you know, at the Reagan Institute Summit on Education, someone who I actually met there and we started to establish a partnership was the president of Arizona State University. Oh. Um, he was featured on a panel there. He and I actually actually missed the session, um, but, but it was, we missed the session after he, he presented um, because a man after my own heart and talking about being a futurist and understanding that it can't just be one-off programs no. where, you know, we have that we connect. It ha it's going to have to be something with a lot more substance to it. Um, because we are literally having to be more creative about what does it really look like to educate um, a, a person, right? What does it look like to educate them and have them with some level of expertise when they leave? Does it take four years to earn, you know, should it take four years to earn a bachelor's degree? Uh, and then also um, with community colleges, I think there are some really interesting, and, and I would encourage everyone to to really look closely at the Peoria area. So we're part of the Tri-County area that includes Peoria, Illinois, which is right in our back door. They are a great partner of ours. Um, and so it's going to look like things like the uniquely Eureka Promise. So for nearly a dozen, nearly, nearly, yeah, a dozen years now, Peoria has had in place uh, the Peoria Promise, where they have sent students from that area to community college tuition free, right? To Illinois Central College, tuition free. So at Eureka, one of the things we did in talking about being a futurist, Janet, is said, why can't they earn a four-year degree, right? So let's let's help work with the, the city of Peoria and their great leadership and Mayor Jim Artis. Let's work with the wonderful president of Illinois Central College, Sheila Cork Bailey, and let us come together, Eureka College, and figure out how we can forge a partnership for low income, right? Pale eligible graduates of community college and allow them to then come to Eureka tuition free. So we rolled that out a couple of years ago, um, the, the, the Promise program. Which unlikely, is unlikely partners, yeah. Unlikely partners, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to require some unlikely partnerships, some people who are coming together with the most innovative minds there are, um, who are willing to completely abandon the status quo. And abandoning the status quo doesn't mean that you don't, you don't stay true to some mission and values. Um, it absolutely doesn't mean that. Um, a lot of people mistake, mistake it for that, right? When you say, don't, don't follow the status quo. But um, in, in five years and 10 years in higher education, those unlikely partnerships are going to become more and more prevalent. And they're going to become more and more necessary. In five or 10 years, it's not going to take four years to earn a bachelor's degree. We will have figured out a way 
to work in the community. The community of, of Fiore, I sit on the, the CEO council and the, the economic development council. And we are literally right now, Janet, working on regional essential skills. So re across the region. So imagine the, the gravity of that for a minute, if you will. And I encourage everyone to take a look, a closer look at that, where the colleges are, have come together, the businesses have come together, right? Um, the K-12. responsibility for students becoming citizens. Incredible. Yes. So K-12 has come together. So we're literally all around the table. So we're going to be the model. I'll tell you, Eureka College, all of the other area in this, in this region of Central Illinois, we're going to be a model because you have all of these CEOs and all of these leaders in these respective industries who have now come together and we have created um, a curriculum that K-12 will have its piece of it. The colleges and universities will have its piece of this essential skills curriculum and the businesses will already be on board having given the green light for this curriculum and saying these are the skills that we need our workforce to possess when they graduate with a bachelor's degree for those in demand, high demand careers um, that are going to be more important for post COVID, you know, now more than ever. Um, so everybody's come together around the table and developed an actual full fledged curriculum that we're preparing to roll out. We're piloting it now. COVID uh, held us up just a little bit, but that's what higher ed is going to have to look like. It's going to have to get in the sandbox and roll up our sleeves and play in that sandbox in a way that we never have before. We can't be tone deaf, right? We can ill afford to be tone deaf because wow. the value proposition for me is, is clear, right? And, and when you look at nursing, for example, well, you need a, you need a second post-secondary degree in order to, to be a nurse, right? Um, and, and again, if you can be the, the, know everything there is to know about, about where to stick somebody and all the medicines and all that stuff, all you want, but if your bedside manner is not quite right, right? So there's still a need for that liberal arts foundation um, that a Eureka College provides. And so it's gonna take something like that for all of us to think in ways that we never imagined thinking before. Um, it's gonna take people to not be so siloed uh, and to not feel so threatened by uh, you know, a community college right up the road or a larger institution like an Arizona State um, who's doing some great things. It's going to take us to say, I love what you're doing. And I guarantee you, if you partner with us and we add our piece to that, we're going to create something that's that much more beneficial to all of the community and the citizens of whom we're trying to educate. Well, thank you for sharing us this insight. Um, we could go on forever, but I'm going to move on to our lightning round right now. Okay. Um, please share with me uh, your favorite speech by President Reagan. So, okay, um, I have to tell you two. Um, so one, I have to tell you it's the Berlin Wall speech now, but I will tell you the Berlin Wall speech. Um, now, uh, let me let everybody know, you know this, Janet, that I am actually a communication scholar and expert by training. Um, all of my degrees are in communication. Uh, so I give you this answer, not only as you know an, an observer and citizen, but I give you this answer also as an expert in communication. Uh, and one who has critiqued many a speech. Uh, so the Berlin Wall speech actually was, it was okay, but the, the, the thing that takes it over the edge is of course the famous words, right? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That is transformational, just that one line. Action. Yeah. Um, it's so effective. And the thing that I think is the beauty of that is when you understand the backstory of where a lot of the advi his advisors actually suggested he not include that and not say that, it's a true sign of leadership to know and to be able to listen to your folks and know when to, when to adopt and embrace what they're saying and when to say, okay, no, I think I'm right about this, right? To take that educated risk. And he did that with that speech. So that's what makes me say that. But otherwise, I will tell you, if it wasn't for Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, it would be a vision for America. In, the, uh, in that A Vision for America speech, um, you know, that's where one of the places where Reagan talked about the shining city on a hill. Mm -hmm. That's where, very appropriate to the times we're in, he talked about it not being about black or white or Christian or, you know, he, he talked about all of those things or Catholic, uh, you know, or Catholic or Jewish, um, it was, but, you know, not, a, not being about Republican or Democrat, not being about any of those things, but really being about how do we come together, united, 
so that all of us might be able to benefit from the promise of America and American opportunity. So definitely a vision for America in terms of the, con the full content of the speech, the delivery of the speech, the actual spirit of the speech um, and what that means. But the Berlin Wall has to be included there. You know, and I think what ties those two together is the, the moral clarity, the insistence on this is what is right. So that's really powerful. And how about um, a favorite quote? So, okay, again, I'm speaking, it's twos today. It's all about twos and not one. <laughs> Uh, well, so give you the have, Eureka advantage of, of yeah, that's right. The, the <laughs> uniquely Eureka advantage, is, is, you know. Uh, but no, there's so there are two quotes too. Uh, again, I think you know, apropos for for this moment, one is if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, we will be a nation gone under. Uh, we have to remember that we are one nation, one nation under God. Uh, and, you know, the, and none of us is perfect, uh, and we all are striving to be better, and at our very core, at the very foundation, we all want the same things. We all want the same things for our families, for our children, right? We all want quality education. We all want to experience the, the freedoms um, that, of the, that America promises us. We all want that pursuit of happiness, right? Whatever that might be, your own definition of that. Um, but we all want that that elbow room to be able to grow and develop and evolve. Um, and as you said, change your mind as you learn different things. We want to be those lifelong learners, critical critical thinkers, problem solvers. Um, and the only way we can do that is to keep in mind that we are one nation under God. Uh, so that's one. If we ever forget we're one nation under God, we will be a nation gone under. The second one, again, I think appropriate for this moment, is... Um, if if you're not concerned with who gets the credit, right, 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 mm -hmm. it's it's the you know if if um, there's no limit to the amount, I think the exact quote is there's no limit to the amount of good you can do if you're not concerned with who gets the credit. So and that was I think Reagan at his best again the Berlin Wall speech right he wasn't concerned about it, it it's not about oh you know you have you're saying this and it's not me saying it so then it's wrong. Um, but it's it's if if you're not concerned with who gets the credit, the sky's the limit on the amount of good that we can do as individuals, and definitely the amount of good that we can do as a society and as a country. Well, thank you so much for your insight, for your time, Dr. Jamel Wright. Sending my best uh, to you, your loved ones, and the Eureka family. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you again for the invitation. It has definitely been an honor and pleasure. Anytime I have this, this opportunity to talk about Eureka College and our Eureka College and Reagan story, which is a very compelling one. And once again, if you've not visited Eureka College, if you, you've never heard of Eureka College before, a lot of people think uh, Eureka College is in California when, they, when it's associated with, with Ronald Reagan. Um, but visit Eureka, Illinois, and you will see all of the amazing things that I just described live and in person. So I highly encourage everyone to do that. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity and I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Great. We're cut? Yeah, we're good to go. Well, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I think that was, that was great. I think it was pretty good. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I, I love learning more about your background and just you know chatting about the things that are happening at Eureka right now, the challenges <laughs> I can't even imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's there's there's a lot of amazing work still happening. And, you know, I've been telling the team, we're actually in a strategic planning year. So I've been saying, okay, you all, we can't just be focused on what <laughs> right plan around that. Yeah. As all encompassing as it might be, you know, we still got to look out on the horizon, right? We still got to yeah, look at for the future. This isn't forever. And this isn't, yep, a, nope. yeah, this, and, right. and we can't be reactive. It's um, That's right. an opportunity in some strange way. to still be proactive. Network. Absolutely. You've got to still be proactive. And there, I mean, I think there's something about it accelerating some of the changes that need to happen in yeah. higher ed. Yeah, I, I do. Great, I, I great disruption leads to innovation. And it this model every was time, every moment. single time. Yep, that's right. Yep. Well, thanks so much for your time. I don't want to keep you away from thanks, the students. Man. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. 
And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do. That would be a very American thing to do.